to tour my state and talk about poetry. It just is a very unique experience. I don't know if I've been the first in anything. <laughs> and so why not a black woman to lead the poetry advocacy in Michigan? Nandi, we're sitting at uh, Source Booksellers. What does this mean to you, this space? Oh man, uh, bookstores for writers, they are a lifeline. Um, they're the place where we find our next read. They're the place that we find community. The bookseller always knows something about every single piece of reading material in the room. But also like once you start publishing, it's, they're the people that are going to introduce your work to their customers, you know? So I've always loved booksellers, but the source is a, like, it has a big little spot in my heart because um, as a black owned business, as a, as a nonfiction um, centered right. bookstore, it's very unique. It brings together a unique kind of um, list of activities and readings and They've always opened their doors to the community that I'm networked with. So I would, anytime anyone says they want to come into town, the source is on my list. So we're going to take them. Yeah. What is that charge like to see your published work in a book place, a source like this? Oh man, um, it means a lot to see my books on the shelves. As a writer, there's so much time that goes into that published book. I know that Oftentimes readers are bombarded by thousands of books every year that are published and they maybe aren't aware of just how long it took to, from the moment that the first idea kind of sparked in the writer's mind to getting to the publisher, finding someone that will, that will publish the work and then finally getting it into a bookstore. Like there are so many steps in between that. And so to see, to walk into a store and see one of my book covers on the shelves, it's really just uh, humbling and gratifying. The big news that you are Michigan's Poet Laureate, the first one in 60 years mm -hmm. and the first black woman mm -hmm. to ever hold that. What does that mean to you? Um, you just said three things that are, that are key. So Michigan is my home. It's where I was raised. I, um, I feel very proud to come from Detroit. It's all in my writing. Um, so to be selected to tour my state and talk about this other thing that I love, which is poetry, it just is a very unique experience. But once I heard that Michigan hadn't had a poet laureate in 60 years, even before I was a candidate, I was talking with other poets and talking about how important it was going to be to have someone in that position and how important it would be to get the state to continue to support it because Michigan was only one of four states that did not have a poet laureate. And so it made it, it's really important to me that we have someone that advocates for literature that not only, um, is going around reading their own literature, but is talking about the rich history that Michigan has. And then that last thing that you said about um, being the first black woman to hold the position, I just, I've never been, I don't know if I've been the first in anything. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, wow. And to be, um, to make history for my community and my culture is really important to me. But also I think that the, that our state should be looking at what black women have to say. We have been at the forefront of a lot of the issues, not just literature, but in politics. And we are always spearheading the way that culture changes and what not, why not a black woman to, <laughs> to lead the poetry advocacy in Michigan. And I think also to see you in the front of the room in that way, and you've done a lot of work with kids mm -hmm. and in the education process. And as now Michigan's Poet Laureate, being able to outreach and represent in a different way, what does that mean to you? It means a lot. Um, I know that my time working as a, a writer in residence has primarily been in the Detroit area. So it means that I am working with youth that have similar backgrounds as myself. 
And I've already seen how it changes their ideas of options that they have. I not only am a published poet, I'm a writer, I'm a world traveler. They're seeing an example that is outside of anything that they maybe encounter every day. And that's not to say that there aren't other very strong examples in their community. But I think that culturally we have some misconceptions about the lives of artists. And so once they, I am teaching them how to tap into their voices and then they're saying that, oh wait, you came from my neighborhood and you've learned how to express yourself in a way that makes you feel more free even if they don't become professional poets, mm -hmm. I'm very excited to be able to inspire you to be able to have access to a space of their own expression. And I'm really looking forward to being able to do that for Michigan as well. I'm curious, what are the misconceptions that we have about artists? Oh, that we're depressed and struggling <laughs> and um, that our art only comes from suffering. And I think that there is a reason for that stereotype. There are some artists out there that have that kind of uh, artistic practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I also don't want to disregard the need for funding the arts. That is definitely there. There are a lot of artists that what they really want are their projects funded, you know, but I think that once you enter into the artist community, you start to realize that it's a rich community of supportive people who are really exploring that have these really vibrant imaginations. And they're taking from everything in order to produce their art from AI to sports. And so you realize that the art world is really rich and not all black and bleak. Yeah. I take Well, so take me back to when you were younger mm -hmm. and you first... I guess, who helped you first discover your gift so, or first saw your gift? So um, I have all these uh, key memories that help, that I say shifted me in a sense. Um, I had always for a long time, um, when I was young, I used to keep a journal. I used to, I was very religious when I was young, so I used to write, write my prayers. I was always engaging in a kind of literary practice, I guess. But once I got to high school, I had a teacher, Terry Blackhawk, who later became the founder of Inside Out Literary Arts Project. And she had developed a, a framework for inviting professional poets into classrooms. And so she had invited all these professional poets in to talk to us and teach us around writing. And I really was inspired by how they were figuring out how to do the work. But it wasn't until I met another poet, Vivi Francis, in a summer program. I was uh, in the um, I was in the summer youth employment program, and they had a summer the like youth arts wing of the summer youth mm. employment program, where we produced a whole theater production at the end of the summer. And Vivi, she said, "You know, the poems you write are good, but I don't think I think you might be writing what you think poetry is instead of." using your voice and saying that that is poetry. Interesting. So trying to fit it into a box that you had thought yeah, that that's I, what a poet is. I was definitely holding up my papers and going, is this right? And she was like, no, no. Is it right? Have you, have you said everything you needed to say? Have you accessed your voice the way that you want to access your, you want to write? Is that what, is that what is so difficult about poetry sometimes for people to understand? They shy away from it because they think they're not either worthy of it or doing what they're supposed to be doing with it? <laughs> yeah, I think that's part of it. But I think, um, I think the other part is that poetry usually isn't taught by poets. Usually your first encounter with poetry is a teacher who has to teach a lot of different subjects and maybe has not really engaged in poetry in the way that like a poet would. And I think it takes a poet to really, uh, engage a new learner on poetry. Because one of the things that we know about poems is that there are so many poems out there. There is a poem for everyone. I tell it, <laughs> even the most reluctant poetry reader, they, I just give me a minute, I can find a poem for you. And it's because poems can be about anything. Poems can be about baseball. They can be about a fire, they can be about love. We all know that, right? I think my first entree <laughs> to poetry was Shel Silverstein. 
Oh yeah. You know, I mm-hmm. mean, when you think about being younger, that's, oh, it's, it's rhymy. It's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like the first, you know, part mm-hmm. that I can remember of poetry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I think sometimes when we get to high school, we start to learn that it has to be interpreted, not just enjoyed. And I wonder if that might be a little misleading for this, for the average person who later on is just when they go to pick up a book, they're not necessarily thinking about, am I going to interpret this literature? They really just want to enjoy it. And sometimes they don't even know why they enjoy it. They just love reading it. I mean, I kind of wish that we could um, shift the way that we are teaching our young people how to enjoy poetry. What was the first poem then that you wrote that you felt it was your true voice and not a poem that you thought fit the box? Mm. I don't, I can't, I can't say that I really recall that, but I do remember writing a poem that I realized it was, it was at a moment of realizing that my mother had really, um, took a lot of time to guard me against some of the things that were happening in Detroit. Um, I grew up in an area that was very community oriented, but it, but right outside of some of the neighborhoods, there was, um, it had been greatly affected by the crack epidemic. And they had, um, recently there were, um, a lot of folks that had mental illnesses that were, that had been released from, um, uh, being de- not detained, but um, housed. And so I, in that neighborhood, my mother was very protective of me. And I think around 16, I went back to that neighborhood and realized all the things that were happening. And so that poem was this um, confession about how, how deeply concerned for me she was, but then realizing how maybe how dangerous the neighborhood had been. And it was the first time that I like really could feel in my body that it was what I really wanted to say. And every time I read it, I felt really kind of stirred that, oh, I think this is good. And it, and it allowed me to also speak in my own rhythm in the way that I speak. And I was a big hip hop kid. So I was very much thinking about how the slang and things in the poem. So yeah, it, that was the first time that I think I was really engaging the words that I wanted to write. Would you say that in terms of what are the traits that make a, a good poet? Is it curiosity? Is it, what would you say? Yeah, I would agree curiosity. I think um, some of the strongest poems for my taste, and I'm just saying this is just me, I really like poems that pose a question and they don't try to answer them, but they just are asking well, what happened or what if, or what is going on? And they just engage in trying to explore that question more than, um, more than telling people how they have to think, you know? How important is it for us to continue to tap into our creative side? I think when I look at how AI is writing things and creating things and they say, oh, it can, you know, create poetry, can do all these things. And it's easy for us to click a button in the world. But how do we find our creative sides or indulge our creative sides? I think our creative sides are one of the uh, parts of us that make us most human. So... We've seen it in our current contemporary culture where when we don't engage with the most human aspect of us, there's frustration, there's stress, there's depression. There are tons of studies about loneliness and, and some, of the, some of the solutions or some of the approaches to resolving these kind of feelings happen through our own creative expression. It happens through slowing down being observant, allowing yourself to engage with your body. And that's, so I think it's what it, whichever art I'm, a, I'm, I really love to dance, you know? Mm. And um, sometimes it's not waking up in the morning and writing a poem that makes me feel most human. Sometimes it's going and getting out on the dance floor or going to a dance class. And that is another form of creative expression. I think that we really, while AI is a very intriguing, development in our human evolution. Um, 
I think that we will, we have also found ways to be creative with it. It's not purely just spitting out information. Mm -hmm. Some people are taking that and then they're expanding it even more. I really celebrate the creativity that can happen with AI, not just the passive use of it. You talked about, I don't just wake up every morning and, and, and write a poem. What is your process? So I don't write a poem every morning. Let's not, <laughs> let's not get that, let's, let's, not let's put get that, that out right there. out of the way. Yeah. I am, no. <laughs> um, so I'm an early riser. Mm. I have found um, that I really like to be uninterrupted when I am in my time. So I usually wake up before most people are contacting me or reaching out to me or calling my name. And so that usually looks like about five in the morning and I have my coffee and I, um, I usually just allow myself to write what I'm thinking at that time. I don't, exp I don't put a lot of expectations on that writing. I think that's really interesting that you say that. So it's no judgment. I, I think sometimes when we sit down and we go to write, when I've even tried to do this, you've already putting a lot of parameters on it and, and expectations mm -hmm. of this is what I want to be able to say. Mm -hmm. So you're just saying, if you want to create, sit with your thoughts and then free write. Yeah, I, I think that that is one of the most effective ways for me to write. I um, am oftentimes thinking about a lot of the same things for a season. And so oftentimes I will just write. And um, I for new writers, I tell them to give themselves a set time to do it. So start off with five minutes. Don't, don't. Don't give yourself a half an hour. That's just way too much for a new person. Um, and so what I do is I might just write whatever comes to my head. And then it, I know something is happening when I go, oh, wait, that's, that's something. And I maybe don't even explore it at that moment, but I might come back to it later. And I do read, I don't read them exact right after I write them. I usually give it a little bit of time, at least a week to like go back and look at what I was thinking about. But sometimes if it, if it gets me going, I might end up for a whole week writing to that subject. And then the real work is the revision, the revision. Mm. You may have a really good idea, but if you don't allow yourself to really kind of work through the lines and allow yourself to decide how do you want to present that idea? Is it, is it a rhyming poem? Is it a form poem? Is it a free verse? You know, that can take months, years to get that piece out. Let's go back to the quote that I, that I read that you said that poets yearn to be seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that you're seen? Almost a little too much now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I do. I think that, um, my, what comes out, what, what the act of writing is not necessarily to be seen when I'm engaging in my daily practice. It is because I really do have just so much joy in engaging in language but the work of the after the poem is done, to read it aloud to an audience, to have an audience respond, to have someone read your poem and then tell you about that poem. I had a poet talking, speak about one of my poems and it, the feeling that came over me to hear him nail it. Like, yes, that's exactly what I was thinking of when I was writing that piece. And to know that that person is the person that I was writing to, you know, not necessarily that I was writing directly to that poet, but that is a part of the community that I wanted to hear that poem and I wanted them to get that meaning from. So it, I do feel like in that moment of presentation and the publication at the readings and all of that, that really does um, satisfy that desire to be heard. Ode to the Tongue. Click, twist, flutter. Once again, you stick a tepid towel sound in my mouth. We are in a cafe, a hotel, in a store, trying to order coffee or cookies, and there you go. The long you of you in my lap. I'm a fractured figurine. Language is made of spackled sounds flinting past my eyes. 
We play name games. Guess each mouth shape's word made soft in their lips. What you call imitation is a clanging arrest, a sour misuse of the throat. I trip over syllables. I feel sweat trickle between my breasts. Let these faraway words lie like fuzz on my teeth. Tongue, have you noticed how troubled you have become? I cannot maneuver conversations without you slipping out of place. You twist around like a trapped bull. I have tried to force you out of your silent ending. We are native to people who can't stop speaking foreign languages. There is no space for timidness tongue. Loop into a long word like lung. Lay the lengthy trills on the backside of paladar. At some tables, tongue and language are the same. Don't bother translating decorum. Each country sets with its own formal address and common clatter a shock in the mouth. In this mouth, let's send a curling G galloping across some desert with the rolling R's ribbon heart. This is going to be an exciting two years for you. You talked about not getting caught up in title in accomplishment and um, you've seen your, your career take a lot of different turns. This isn't a pinnacle for you. You see this as just another, another path. Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't consider it just another path. This is an acknowledgement that is a very big deal. I, it isn't something that I set my heart out to do when I started writing poetry. I don't think that I ever would have thought Laureate would have been behind my name at all when I started writing poetry. Um, and honestly, up until last year, I didn't even think it was a possibility. <laughs> so, um, but I think one of the things that, that keeps me going are the goals in my own writing. To know that I still have a poem in me is what really keeps me going, not necessarily the, um, the positions, you know. I think that if it weren't for the writing, then I probably wouldn't be as excited about doing the work itself. Because I, I know how poetry, I know how it feels in my body. And so I'd love to share that love with other folk and only hope that they find a few moments of joy in writing, not necessarily becoming professional poets. I, that's not mm -hmm. my goal, but I do really think that if I'm not writing, then it doesn't matter where the career is going. If I'm not writing, I'm probably going to be miserable. Wow. We can't wait to see what's next. <laughs> Thanks for the time. Thank you.